Welcome to The Detour. I'm Adam Davis. Today is the start of our third season of The Detour. To celebrate, we're bringing you the first of a three-part mini-series on belonging. Belonging to a place, a people, maybe a way of being. A couple of months ago, we held a Consider This event with the journalist and author Casey Parks, who you'll hear from later in this series, about what it means to belong, or not belong, in the place you grew up. After the program, as usual, we encouraged audience members to talk with people they didn't know about what they were thinking in response to the conversation. I was struck by how many people talked about their sense of not belonging. Everyone I spoke to, without exception, felt like, in one way or another, they didn't belong. They had grown up with a different culture, or were far away from home, or left the religion they were raised in, or simply felt like they didn't fit in. The particulars of the stories differed vastly from each other, and from my own story. But, oddly, through those conversations about not belonging, I walked away from the Alberta Rose Theater that night feeling more like I did belong. Today, you're going to hear from Putsada Riang, who has worked on a few stories with Oregon Humanities over the years, about Chinese farmers and vegetable peddlers in Portland, about Chinese hops farmers in Central Oregon, and about leaving Southeast Asia as an infant and returning much later as a journalist. Putsada is from Corvallis. She is also from Cambodia. In this conversation, and in her book, Ma and Me, Putsada speaks with candor, emotion, and insight about the challenges that come with being from and of multiple cultures. As you'll hear, Putsada loves her Cambodian family and Cambodia itself. She also loves Garth Brooks and hot dogs and Ruffles potato chips. And she loves her wife, which has posed serious challenges to feeling at home with her family and both of the cultures she's from. This conversation with Putsada starts slowly and goes deep. Much of it revolves around home, family, belonging, and the heart, and the costs of being who we are. We're delighted to share this conversation with you and really grateful to Putsada for sharing so much of herself with us. Uh, hey, Putsada, welcome to uh, this conversation for The Detour. Hey, Adam. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. Now, um, Putsada, you, even as we were saying hello, talked about being in a few different places in the last couple of days. <laughs> right. uh, I think maybe... Uh, Maybe I want to ask, like, where does it feel like home base is these days for you? That question is so timely. I've been in so many places across our own country, places I've never been. Yesterday, actually, was a true homecoming because I was down in Corvallis, right. which is my hometown. And I was invited there to speak at this, uh, the new Corvallis Museum, which is this gorgeous uh building that wasn't around when I was there. And I was not expecting very many people to go. Mm. I, I don't know. I guess in my mind, I thought since it was in middle of the day, 1030 a.m., I thought maybe we'd get, you know, 12 people there. The place was packed. They oh. had to get more chairs. It ended up being standing room only. It was so neat. But beyond that, what I spoke about yesterday that's very different from the talks I've given in other parts of the U.S. is that I spoke about this idea of place yeah. and how throughout my life and throughout my career as a journalist, when I've been in situations and I've been in countries that are stressful and difficult, Afghanistan in particular, but not only Afghanistan, I was in Thailand when there was a military coup and that was exceptionally stressful, especially with my work as a journalist. Mm -hmm. In my mind, one of the things that I do, just tricks that I play on my mind just to reclaim a sense of calm mm. is I actually think about places in Corvallis. Mm -hmm. It might sound weird to say because at the same time that Corvallis is a place that I really feel at home, it's also a place that was difficult because my family yeah. was one of very few mm -hmm. non-white families mm -hmm. in that town. And yet, as I mentioned to my fellow Corvallis residents yesterday, of all the places my family could have ended up when we immigrated from Cambodia and arrived in the U.S., 
Corvallis couldn't have been a more perfect place to grow up as a kid and to be held mm. by a community and to be held by the landscape. This gorgeous Willamette Valley where sounds echo and the air is filled with the sweetness of this perfume of strawberry scent and everything there is just so beautiful and gorgeous. Mm. And immediately, just before I hit city limits yesterday, I already was feeling that sense of calm return in mm. me, just looking across the, the land and seeing the curtains of hills and whatnot. It's, so Corvallis is it. It's yeah. I will always feel at home there every time. Yeah, it's interesting how you already are talking about a kind of a association of home with calm, mm-hmm. even though it was also difficult in some ways. And, and maybe it's worth noting you also lived in Kaiser. Right. And did you also live in Portland? Yeah, I didn't live in Kaiser. My folks live there now. I actually, I, I drove up from their house. Um, but I lived in Portland for just a minute. Okay. Portland was an experiment for me. And what I will say about my time here is that seeing my own home state with new eyes mm-hmm. and really trying to get to know the Northwest in a different way, having spent you know so many years up until that point living internationally, mm-hmm. um, I absolutely love whenever I move to a place, immediately trying to understand the history and 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 learn about people of of that place and Portland was no different mm-hmm. and actually that's how I started to really get curious about people who were here before I ever was before any of my neighbors were and that led me down to some interesting places and as so, far as storytelling goes and so in a way maybe I can Ask, did you do that same kind of thinking in Corvallis, for example? Did you think, huh, uh, we're relatively new and we're rel- there are relatively few folks from Cambodia. Have there been people from our place here before? Absolutely. And that, that led me to discover that I'm about 99% certain that my family was the very first Cambodian family in Corvallis. Uh-huh. There's, there are no records that I could find. Uh-huh. And, and I do some pretty substantive sleuthing as a journalist. I could not find any uh-huh. records that would indicate otherwise that, that anybody before my family arrived in 1975 um, had come from Cambodia. Mm. Um, yesterday I spoke about, you know, the audience long before all of us were there. The Kaya, uh, Kayapuya tribe was there. And the, that uh, I spoke about this idea of, of human migration. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the human condition, which is that we're constantly moving around. However, there are many communities who are forced to migrate, um, not of their own volition of their, or their own desire, but forced either by policy uh, or by circumstance yeah. to leave the place that they called home. And for your family... And maybe, I, maybe I'll start with you a little bit. You arrived in Corvallis as a very young person. That's right. Uh, what do you remember first about that place? What, can I ask you that question? Like, how did it come to life for you as a little person? Yeah, I love that question so much just because I have been thinking about that a lot. Having been back to Corvallis just yesterday, I drove past the duplex, which is the first place my family lived when we arrived in Corvallis. It's still there. We ended up moving, gosh, less than less than a mile away from that duplex eventually and and, um, lived in our own home. But that duplex, I had a lot of memories there because when my family first arrived, some of my earliest memories, of course, were formed in the in the what I consider like a place of origin in terms of when my family landed uh, in Corvallis. And, I, you know, I slowed down as I drove. It's on a main road, and so I couldn't slow too much. And there's not really a place to, to pull off, but I did slow down to the extent that I could just take a good look at it. Um, gosh, I remember going with my siblings down to the 7-Eleven to buy Jolly Ranchers candies, which back then was three cents per candy. Uh-huh. And I remember the backyard we had a backyard big enough where we could just run laps and play Red Rover. Mm. My mom, in my memory, and as is true now, was in the kitchen trying to figure out how to use these appliances. In Cambodia, she only cooked 
over an open flame. Mm -hmm. Suddenly in the U.S., she was met with an electric stovetop and had no clue at all how this thing worked. And so one of my earliest memories is she took an entire chicken from its sleeve, put it on right on top of the range, expecting it to cook. But that's not how people cook in the U.S., of course, and on an electric range. And so the learning curve for all of us Mm. was really high. I did not speak English at all until I arrived in kindergarten. Even kindergarten, I didn't speak English. But what was one of the best memories I have is that my siblings all went to school. And so they walked to our elementary school, Wilson Elementary School. And when they would come back, they would say these these words, these English words. And I would just I just remember being so fascinated. Like, what is this weird language uh-huh. that they're speaking? Because up until that point, I only spoke the language of my country, Cambodia, which is the Khmer language. And I just remember being so fascinated. Like, first of all, what is this thing called school where they're going for all day long and I'm stuck at home uh-huh. you know, with my mom? And then they're saying these words that I have no idea what they mean. And it was almost as if in that moment, when my siblings were speaking English and I did not, already there was a bit of a divide. Mm -hmm. What I failed to recognize in that moment was that by the time I entered school and learned English, that divide would be complete between my siblings and I and our parents Mm -hmm. because they never formally took English classes the way that we would learn English in school. And I think a lot about this idea of how language really creates so much of a sense of identity. And that when you learn one language, in my case, necessarily, the other language that I had falls away. Mm-hmm. But language is so much more than just words. It's it's a way of living and it's a way of being. It's a point of view and a perspective. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly it wasn't just that I was learning to speak language, but suddenly over time, gradually, as a young kid in Corrales, shifting my mentality away from what I was born with, which was a very deep, ingrained Khmer culture. And suddenly I was thinking like an American because I I am an American. Mm -hmm. But I think in hindsight, looking back, that must have been a terrifying moment for my parents to watch these subtle changes, Mm -hmm. the movement away from them, via language, via food, the way we dressed, the things we wanted, the things we wanted to watch, all of these different little pieces. In hindsight, you know, I, in my mind, how, I, how I'm envisioning this is sort of like tiny little paper cuts mm. from my parents mm-hmm. who wanted desperately for their kids. They understood that we needed to assimilate And at the same time, I know for my mom, at least in her core, she had hoped that all of us kids would maintain a measure of fidelity toward our own culture Mm -hmm. because they are, my parents already lost so much by leaving. So it's, it's interesting now thinking about in Ma and me, when you talk about yourself in a way, relearning Kamai and the delight that it brought to your mother, uh, I guess I want to ask sort of how did it feel to go back to Cambodia mm-hmm. and recognize, wait a minute, uh, I'm going to have to do some learning if I'm going to feel at home here. Yeah, that's right. A lot of learning. You know what was weird? I'll be honest with you, Adam. This kind of was just made me so stressed and confused in so many levels. In America, I had to learn how to speak English very quickly when I got to kindergarten. And because of that, the more English I spoke, the less Khmer I spoke until mm-hmm. one day I was not speaking Khmer at all. That must have been an enormous shock and deep sadness for my parents. Mm. When I turned 30 and I went back to Cambodia to work as a journalist, the exact opposite happened. I arrived only speaking English, not speaking a word of Khmer. Yeah. Even though I could comprehend because my parents still spoke Khmer at home, I didn't I couldn't twist my tongue in a certain way to get certain sounds to come out uh, related to my own Khmer language. And there was this really interesting cognitive dissonance because being back in Cambodia, I looked like everybody else, but I couldn't, and I am in my heart, I I believe that I, I have a heart that's more of a Khmer heart than American heart. But being back in Cambodia, I just kind of felt like, 
I'm a, I'm a bit of a fraud because I'm here. I look like everybody, but I can't even speak my own language. And so it was embarrassing. And at the same time, I recognized, you know, I've got to go a little bit gently on myself because mm-hmm. I grew up for 30 years in the U.S. as an American kid. And, and you know, my, my entire life up until that point was in the U.S. That um, so much of moving to, from one place to an, another, you, you do get that feeling of disorientation. Yeah. It was just magnified because of the context and the country where I was, which was back in my home country where I was born. But slowly over time, as I began to learn the Khmer language again, and that was with the help of my aunt and her kids who were so patient with me. And I really learned, I didn't take any Khmer mm. classes. It was really just being out and speaking to people. Mm. I would write down words and then I would call my parents from an internet phone and, and they patiently run down my list of 20 new words I heard that day. What does this mean? What does this mean? And that's how I learned. After a while, when I began to dream in Khmer, I'll never forget that mm-hmm. moment when I had my very first dream and it came out in the Khmer language. I woke up with an enormous smile because I mm-hmm. thought, wow, I'm really feeling so connected to my country and culture all over again. It's making me think of what you said about the paper cuts as you and your siblings moved away and that as you went down that list of words, Khmer words, that yeah. you asked your mother about that there was definitely some like tending to all of that stuff that Absolutely. must have been happening. I ended up living in Cambodia for almost a decade and, and I would come back to Oregon and when my parents would pick me up, at one point I started to speak in Khmer to them hmm. just uh, right out of the gate from the airplane. Mm-hmm. And I think it took my parents by surprise because my parents responded in English. And I said, no, 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 no. Like, this is not supposed to be happening. Like, I'm speaking our own language. But I think because the the sh- they detected the shift, and I think that they weren't expecting that. Mm. And so they responded and reacted in a way that they thought, you know, if I was speaking Khmer, then that meant they had to speak English, which was like, no, you don't have to try to. <laughs> it was really interesting and strange and funny. It's super interesting to hear how language also functions as kind of a proxy for what you said a few minutes ago about your your heart, like that right. you feel like you, you had, I think you said you feel like you have a more Khmer heart right. than American heart. Um How many hearts do you think one person can have? (laughs) Gosh. Well, if I was an octopus, the answer would be two. Okay. (laughs) And I am not. However, um, you know, I think a lot about this idea. I I know it's an overused statement, but I want to, but I want to bring it up here because I feel like it's so true, especially for those of us who are bicultural or binational or more multinational, multicultural, mm-hmm. which is Walt Whitman's line about mm-hmm. how we contain multitudes. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I really do think that that is so true for those of us who don't easily fit inside a box like me. I mean, I'm a Cambodian refugee who's gay, listens to country music, snowboards. You know, I just... It's it's so hard to place me in a box, and in terms of where my heart is, to me, when I when I spoke about that earlier, that I feel like I have a my heart more than a an American heart. What I was getting at there was this no was this idea of just my sentiments mm. and how I how I kind of take the world in and feel it. So so in my culture, we feel things very deeply, and. It's it's a joke among my Cambodian friends and I that uh, our Khmer um, community and our Khmer people, we are so dramatic. Like everything we say ends with the word na, which is like, which is like a lot or much. I see. So if you were to say, if you were to ask me, well, how are you today, Putsada? I would say, oh, I'm doing great, like very much so. Uh-huh. Or if you would ask me if I'm hungry, I wouldn't just say I'm hungry, but I'd say I'm very hungry. And everything ends with na. And it's like, we were joking about that, my friends and I. were like, why is that? Like, can we just be like, yeah, things are fine. But everything is like elevated to another degree. And that's, and I feel like that's my, mm. my heart mm. speaking, coming out through, through words, ver- orally and verbally. Yeah, I love that. Uh, it made me think about my daughter, actually, who <laughs> who I think actually feels things very strongly, but the language uh, and the, 
attitude is sort of a more kind of stoic, maybe even Northwestern, even the, yeah. but Pacific Northwestern. And so even if she feels it strong, she's kind of learned oh. not to say nah, right. not to express nah. <laughs> she's got to say nah. But right. And she's nah, probably not yeah. going to learn it from me, but right. maybe she'll learn <laughs> it from I you. Hope. The last couple things you've said, the strong, the sort of like feeling things strongly and the way you said, like, put put this combination of characteristics in a right. box. I mean, it does seem like both in Ma and me and in, and in your last comment that one of the challenges, uh, and we haven't talked that much about some of the challenges of having different homes, mm-hmm. different languages, different places and different cultures. Um, I guess I want to ask about that. Do you remember as a kid where you started to feel like uh, not only am I moving away from my parents, but it feels hard to be in this place. Like, do you remember what was the early difficult stuff? Mm, Yeah. Well, that was definitely Corvallis as well. That had to do a lot with the fact that I understood I was different early on growing up in Corvallis. Mm. How did you, how did you understand that? Looking around my classrooms from elementary school to middle school to high school and seeing all my friends with white skin, Mm. there's a, there's a moment that I'll never forget when I was in the second grade. And I was coming into my own consciousness in a way, I think, when we were working on handwriting. Um, I was must have been asleep at the well on that exercise, by the way, because my handwriting right now is chicken <laughs> scrawl. I cannot read my own handwriting, which is why I think God for laptops. So yeah. Yeah. And um, in Mr. Nordyke's class back then, and I'm not sure that that's the case now in schools, but back then, of course, we had good old fashioned lined paper with a number two pencil with an eraser on the top. If you made a mistake, you'd flip your pencil over and use the eraser. Mm. And as if by magic, that mistake would disappear. And something in my mind clicked and I thought, huh. If I could use this eraser to make a mistake on the page disappear, what would happen Mm. if I put it on my own skin and begin to rub? Mm -hmm. And so I did. I rubbed my arm until a red welt emerged. And Mr. Nordyke came, bent low to my ear and said to me, Putsada, don't do that. Now, I watched patiently when I got home to see if that red welt would turn white eventually. Like, Mm. did my experiment work? And of course it didn't, because we cannot erase the color of our own skin. And it was in that moment that I understood something fundamental about my place in Mm. Corvallis Mm. and my place in the world, which is that by the fact of who I am and the fact of the color of my skin, I would always be different. Mm. But there was also another difference that was not a visible difference and that I didn't tell anybody because I didn't have the language for, I was even confused about. And that difference had to do with how I felt about girls versus Mm -hmm. boys. Mm -hmm. And I understood early on that what I felt about girls, I don't know if, I don't know if perhaps in society, I picked up some messaging that we're not meant to like girls in a certain way. We're not meant to like people of our own gender that we're born with in a certain way. But I did, I had very strong feelings for for friends of mine who were girls. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of guy friends too, you know, boys that I hung out with, mostly, you know, tagging along with my brother and whatnot, because I was such a tomboy when I was growing up. But I just had this, I just had such a deep well of emotion for my girlfriends that I couldn't quite figure out what that was about. And um, also growing up within my culture, my mom used to tell my sisters and I, specifically us, when you grow up, you have a husband. And when you do, you have to have a hot meal ready for him. (laughs) And it's like, now my mom would be so canceled for saying something like that. But of course, growing up in our family, We take those messages in and internalize them. And so at a young age, knowing that I had these feelings for girls and recognizing that something in that was wrong, Mm. also knowing that my mom all but guaranteed I was going to grow up and have a husband because I would better learn how to cook and have a hot meal ready for him every night. 
I decided to tuck those feelings I had for girls away. I hid them. Mm -hmm. And eventually I realized I was hiding from myself the fact of who I am, which is that I am gay. And that fact would not emerge, or I should say, I would not allow myself to admit that to myself until until much later, until my early 20s. So thanks for talking about that as clearly as you just did. It, it is making me think about like the different ways when we show up in groups, mm -hmm. whether it's our class or with family members, there's, there's like, there's the visible markers of similarity and difference, like our skin mm -hmm. or our language. And then in a way there's the internal stuff, which nobody can see. That's right. Uh, like, how do those sit for you? Do you, like, what do you feel like is the relationship between the internal stuff as it emerged for you that felt like it was putting you outside mm -hmm. and the more visible or given external stuff? Yeah. Oh, it's all painful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of it yeah. is pain. I used the word disorienting earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really encapsulates what what that feeling is both externally and internally. When when we are out in the world, when I am out in the world physically existing as an Asian American woman, mm -hmm. I'm acutely aware of my own skin color, particularly with the recent and ongoing increase in hate crimes against my community. Mm -hmm. I'm also very aware that even after I came out, I have straight privilege and people don't automatically assume that I'm gay, mm. which is, is has been its own interesting uh, dilemma. Um, well, I call it a dilemma. It's not really a dilemma. It's, it's more of a, just a situation. But then when you, when you add on top of that an internal displacement, mm -hmm. not feeling at home within myself, I think that that just creates one more layer mm of heartache really and 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 how do we reckon with all these disparate parts of ourselves and how do we reckon with that depth of pain when when we don't feel comfortable within ourselves that's a lot uh a lot to sit with and <laughs> it and it's interesting to think about uh maybe i keep thinking about the heart that you mm -hmm. talked about earlier and i think towards the end of Ma and me you say something about home being essentially being with people you love. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm wondering about the sense of displacement and when it seems not to be there. Mm. What, what are the conditions under which all those different kinds of displacement seem not to be there? Yeah. I have an answer for you on that because I've been thinking about that myself. And over the course of writing my memoir, actually, that uh, the answer to that question really came to bear. It's those moments when I feel like I can disappear, not stand out so much. Mm -hmm. In the context of Cambodia, when I went there to work as a journalist, I began to really get to know my relatives very well. In fact, I was having dinner at, at one of my aunt's house um, regularly, probably four or five times a week. And in the beginning, in those first early two or three years that I was living in Cambodia, my aunt loved to make me the butt of jokes about her American niece. And then what happened is that interestingly, after a while, I, I really, I, I think a lot about this idea of how we um, not only belong in a place, but we belong to a place. Mm -hmm. And I begin to feel that very deeply about Cambodia the longer that I live there, because the, the longer I live there, the more I as a person changed and adapted directly into the context of Cambodia. I was I would be going to the pagodas with my aunt. Even though I didn't know the Buddhist chants, I knew how to prostrate before the Bud the Buddhist monks. I knew how to give alms. I knew all of these things. And that was really me learning by watching. And mm. that's probably the the reporter in me as well. But after a while when I began to speak Khmer fluently and I began to dress more conservatively the way that my cousins my age would dress, for instance, and I would be eating all of the different foods rather than be squeamish as I was in the first few years of living in Cambodia. Uh -huh. 
I was no longer the butt of jokes about being this American niece or American granddaughter Mm -hmm. who's come home. And it was almost as if I just completely melded into the environment and I became one of my relatives who, like, fully Khmer. And then also on the American side of things, to me where I feel the most belonging and the most sense of home really is with people, with people who know me. Mm. I can let my guard down and I can just be who I am. In other words, there's a version of me is that my friends joke about like the professional put, you know, I'm on stage, I'm, you know, I'm speaking a certain way. You know, my friends and my family have noticed that that there are these different versions of me, but when I'm at home and I can, you know, kick off my shoes or or at the home of my friends or my family and just be who I am, it feels like such a relief. Like you can you can shed all these layers of yourself. It's almost as if when I walk out my front door, I've got to put on a certain armor and mm. add all these layers to myself just to survive the days. Yeah. And yet when I'm surrounded by family and friends and there's that safety just inherent and there's that knowing and, and people who love me and know me for who I am and I don't have to be somebody else for them. Yeah. It's such a relief. Like you feel this incredible weight off of you. To me, that feels so much like home because home should be the place where you feel safe. Home should be the place where you can take a breath and just, and know you're going to be just fine. Yeah. I think I want to ask, while you were talking, I was thinking about the challenge of of your mom and how close that relationship has been and how Mm -hmm. central and that it was very hard for many years and may still be hard to let your guard down mm-hmm. fully, to to be fully, like, kick your shoes off mm-hmm. and be okay. But I want to ask first, I want to ask, like, what's your sense of where where your mother feels that? Like, what for her feels like, ah, I'm home? It's Cambodia, huh. a hundred percent. Uh-huh. It's being in Cambodia. The few times I've been with my mom in Cambodia and I've watched her interact with her relatives, go to the open market, eat these beautiful tropical fruits, laugh out loud with her uncle. The kind of smile and the way my mother's face shines in Cambodia is unlike anything Mm. I'd ever seen here in America. It's Cambodia. That is her home. She had told me many times over the course of me interviewing her for my book We had a great life. If there was no war, we would have never left. We had no reason to go. But she has only visited since then? She she has made her life here. She has. My you know, for as much as my mom loves Cambodia, my parents are are frankly just as American as their kids because you know, I was down there visiting. Girlfriend had a hot dog. With Ruffles potato chips on a plate, and that was the lunch she had made for my dad. And I was like, are you all kidding me right now? Yeah. <laughs> You're over here eating the hot dogs? What's up? I was expecting to have, like, my mom's, you know, homemade Cambodian ribs and all this. I mean, you can't beat a hot dog and <laughs> you chips. Can't. It's true. And, yeah. And so she, yeah, she, I, I asked her one time, I said, will you and Pa ever go back to Cambodia to live? And she said, well, we we don't have a reason to now because all of our kids are here. Mm. And and America is our home, too. Every 4th of July, my dad puts an American flag on the flag holder in front of their house. And for as much as I think that they deeply, deeply miss their homeland, they've also, because of being here in America for so long, have embraced America as their as their second home because it is. It also sounds like both of them and you and your siblings, even before you had too much of a choice in the matter, were sort of helping lots of extended family feel more at home here. That's right. Yeah. And that is, you know, I think a lot about that that idea of how many people my parents helped bring to America who had survived the genocide. And because of them, there's this vibrant Khmer community here in Oregon. You can feel it. it. It's palpable. It's here in Portland, in the Portland suburbs. It's in Salem. It's in the Salem suburbs. 
when there's an event, there's a party, somebody's graduating or getting married or a funeral, I swear that my community turns out in oh, droves uh-huh. in massive numbers. And it's because we are all so closely connected. Mm. And I think to your question regarding belonging earlier, I really do think that community has so much to do with it. When 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 there's a critical mass of people from a certain country or culture, almost as if we are an island unto ourselves within the broader context of America, I think nothing builds a closeness and community more than knowing that everybody in that community are outsiders within the context of Amer- of America, mm-hmm. but that we also, by virtue of being in America, we, we are also Americans. But it's that duality I was... I was trying to articulate earlier regarding having fidelity toward our own culture, but also accepting and knowing that America is our home as well. But to me, so much of belonging has to do with what I see in the Khmer community in Oregon in particular. Really, there are two sort of epicenters for the Khmer community. It's Portland or Salem. We didn't have that growing up in Corvallis. There were no Mm. Khmer families until probably the 80s, when more Cambodians who who had survived the genocide made their way over. Uh, But really to have that nexus um, of a place, you know, and there, of course, there are other places I can name. Lowell, Massachusetts, I believe has the largest Khmer population in the U.S. and second only to Long Beach, California. Mm. When I go to those places, I am, I'm like my mom going back to Cambodia. I'm so happy. Uh Immediately, like in Long Beach, my wife and I spent a bunch of time there. And before we even get to our Airbnb, go to the Cambodian noodle house and <laughs> have noodles. That is home. That's belonging. So I want to, I actually want to push on what I think is something a little hard because it's what I think Ma and me does so well, which is go, I feel the sense of belonging with other Khmer folks, mm-hmm. whether it's Long Beach or back in Cambodia. And it's where I can't fully be mm-hmm. some of who, so... Uh, in a way, it's like the possibility to love who you feel like you love mm-hmm. and to be public about that. Uh, how to square those two, the sense of like, I, I feel most comfortable with the people who share my language and maybe my skin color and my food, but there's a big part of me that I can't be. Like, how does that all sit in your head? Yeah, you got me cornered on this question, Adam. You can tell I was trying to avoid... <laughs> answering the first time. I was determined not to get emotional on this interview. Oh. And I, but you know, I, I want to answer because I need to answer. I mean, I wrote a book about this topic. And interestingly, I think some, some people can assume that, oh, you know, if you wrote a memoir, you've already processed whatever you need to process. No, oh, I've got a lot more to process. Yeah. It's been interesting because belonging falls apart when it comes to sexual orientation mm. in my family and in my culture. Completely, completely fell apart. Um, suddenly, when I came out in my family, um, that sense of belonging went went straight out the window mm. because in my culture, the, the Khmer culture is a pretty conservative culture. So that's one layer. There's another layer, which is growing up in Corvallis. Corvallis is a pretty conservative town. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of liberal people there, but... By and large, it's a, it's a it's a pretty conservative place, um, and then you go out another level to where our current country is on the topic of LGBTQ plus mm-hmm. folks like me, with a serious intent to erase people like me, and that's on two levels. That's both in terms of me being Asian American and also me being queer. Mm-hmm. But drilling back down to the family level, it was really hard for my parents to accept that one of their kids is gay. My siblings, on the other hand, have been just fantastic and and, and really solid and ensuring through every intention that they have to embrace me for who I am and when I got married to embrace my wife mm-hmm. and, and let us exist as we are. I, I don't know if that's a generational thing. I, I feel like that's both a generational thing and, and, and in addition to that, a, a cultural thing. It broke my heart when I came out to my parents. And originally, my mom actually 
I thought that she was okay with it. This was in my early 20s, and I was living and working in California as a journalist, and she'd come down to visit. I thought she was okay when I came out to her because of her response, which was that she told me for the first time in my life, I love you, Cohen. And in, in our culture, um, emotions aren't, aren't verbalized. Mm. Love is shown through food. She's going to cook me the best food, and that's her way of telling me that she loves me. And actually, that's what I do <laughs> with my wife. That's uh-huh. what I do with my family uh-huh. as well. It wasn't until I decided to marry my wife that things really went off the rails. Mm. My mom and I fell into a deep, dark hole of conflict. And it occurred to me, it occurred to me when I went back to Kaiser to tell my mom that I was going to marry my wife, that I may never go back home again, Mm. that I may never go see my parents again because Mm -hmm. they wouldn't want me around. I think that my mom, she was really struck by such a deep level of shame. Mm. It started to rub off on me, actually. And I really had to do everything in myself to counter that shame because I do not want to be ashamed of who I am. And I think for her, earlier when I talked about this idea that in Oregon, the, my community is very close knit here. My parents are really seen as leaders in the Khmer community, uh, not just in Salem, but also here in Portland as well. They, my parents wanted their kids to be perfect in the eyes of the Khmer community, and being gay mm. was not part of being perfect. Being gay was being something very strange and unfamiliar, and scary, and weird and frankly, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I think that what makes me sad thinking about that, I'm still emotional about it. Yeah. There's so much in there. I think that my parents could have really changed the way that the Khmer community views Mm -hmm. gay people. Mm -hmm. If they had had the courage to just take a stand. Mm Mm-hmm. Whether they came to my wedding or not, just to take a stand and say, we still love her. Mm-hmm. You kind of want that for every kid. Mm-hmm. And this is why I was avoiding your question earlier. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I'm still emotional on this. Yeah. I mean, you know, towards the end of Ma and Me, when you describe the funeral for your wife's father... And your parents show up. I mean, that that's really something. It's not a huge placard out front that says, okay, we accept this. But it's it felt like a pretty big step. It was huge. Yeah. I can tell you that my mom, in that moment, oh my God, that woman, she saved her relationship with me because mm-hmm. I was prepared mm-hmm. actually not to talk to my parents ever again mm. if they had not met my father-in-law before he died. Yeah. That was my line. I felt very strongly about that. Yeah. It's interesting. It's more than interesting. It's like, uh, I guess in a way, there is this thing with belonging where we probably don't talk about how shame functions in there. That departure from the sense of belonging may often come with the risk of different kinds of shame. Absolutely. Different kinds of shame. And also your question speaks to this idea of the cost of being who we are. Mm. In my case, the cost was pretty damn high. Yeah. The cost was losing my relationship to my mother, who was who I, my entire life up until that point that I announced I was marrying my wife. We were two peas in a pot. Mm. We just were so tight and so close. And that has to do with my origin story of how my family came to America. And that bond, I had always believed, perhaps naively, that that bond would never break. I could not imagine actually anything that would have broken that bond. 
I didn't know that the thing that would break that bond was my sexual orientation mm-hmm. and me being gay. And to me, I think what feels particularly and, and, and profoundly sad about that is that I'm the exact same person. Yeah. I'm still that kid who's going to show up at my parents' doorstep with boxes of fruit and chocolates because I was raised to bring sweets to my yeah. elders. Yeah. I'm still that person who's going to prostrate at the pagoda in front of the monks and do the right thing within that context. I'm still the person who loves my siblings and my family with just an absolute fierceness. Mm-hmm. I have not changed fundamentally who I am because I happen to marry a woman, yeah. and nobody does. And I think that that's what hurts me the most in terms of a lot of what's happening in our American culture right now mm. is that there's this idea that that difference is dangerous somehow and um, that that difference, um, I think that there's this idea that difference is um, is unacceptable. And I think what I've come to decide and feel very much in my heart uh, is that I don't want to be I don't want to be an outcast anymore, as I felt in so many ways, mm-hmm. as we talked about externally and internally. And I don't want to exist on this earth in order to make somebody who doesn't look like me or somebody who doesn't share the same sexual orientation as me or religion as me. I don't want to live my life on this earth existing to make that person feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. I'm now comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. I feel at home in myself now yeah. that I didn't before. And I'm not going to let anybody take that away from me now. I mean, that's a big achievement for any individual. I think that like the hope of feeling comfortable in our own skin, uh, there may be some very unusual people who arrive at that and stay there. But mm-hmm. I think for most of us, that's, as you say, it's something... We have to keep trying to do, and if we get close to it, then it's something probably to hold on to. Absolutely. It's hard won, and anything that's hard won, you just grasp onto it for all your life. Yeah. I'm, it's it's interesting. I'm thinking a little bit about, uh, I'm thinking about your mother again, and I'm thinking about for her, uh, it it sounded and it it sounds now a little bit like in a way it was her fear of being cast out that that led you to feel like more of an outcast at home absolutely i think that my mom has always been afraid of being viewed as less than perfect hmm. and frankly i don't know what circumstances and experiences she had in her own early life Mm. that instilled in her this pressure to always appear perfect. What was hard is that she imposed that kind of living and that kind of way of being on her own children and on her entire family. And so in that way, I talk about this idea in the book that Mott created a fiction out of me. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, she created a fiction out of our family because indeed we were not perfect. Nobody is. But within the context of the Khmer culture, I think she's always been afraid to sort of lose her lot in a way. And her her and my father, their lot is they are respected members Mm. of this Cambodian community that had to recreate itself after escaping a war. It's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of pressure to not only conform and 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 to and to strive for that American dream, but to, to hold on to that place that you've been given as being respected and revered as leaders in your community. Yeah, it's, you said before, you talked about some hard-won stuff, and I think about your folks and coming over in the way they came over, what they were leaving and what they had to build, and how hard-won that must have been and still be for them, and then probably perceiving threats and... Yeah, unfortunately, some of those threats come from from inside. Uh, just so difficult, it seems like, to think of the different kinds of ways we're trying to build a sense of belonging, respect, and the risk of giving up any of that, I guess, is what I'm thinking about. Absolutely. And when, when you're saying that, I can't help but think of this idea that growing up, particularly as a teenager, it's hard enough 
just to be a teenager. But then you begin to add in layers of mm. being a refugee, and you begin to add in layers of being brown-skinned, and you begin to add in layers of um, having less income than your than your peers and working in the berry fields to earn your living. You begin to add in all of these layers, and, and that pressure just mounts and mounts. Honestly, when I think about it now, I don't know how my siblings and I did that. And we survived Corvallis. We survived our childhoods. We're actually... You know, I'm so proud of my siblings, too. We're actually thriving. You know, yeah. it's there's this idea that we owe our parents for the quiet sacrifices they made for us. Because, indeed, they made many, both of my parents. My father was an accountant in the Cambodian Navy before we fled Cambodia. We held a very respectable position within the Navy and, and the broader Cambodian government, and suddenly thrust into Corvallis, a new country, he no longer had his uniform and, and the three stripes on his epaulets. He had an apron mm-hmm. and a spatula, and he was flipping burgers for Burton's mm-hmm. restaurant in downtown Corvallis. And my mom was scrubbing toilets and washing windows as a janitor at the Oregon State University Student Health Center before she became a cook in the dormitories. And when I think about that, like, it's almost this this idea that we spend our lives building up to a certain level. Mm. And then something external like war snatches all of it away. And you're left with nothing, literally nothing. Mm -hmm. And then what is it like to just get back step by step, rebuild your life all over again? And that's the hard one piece. And I think that connecting that back up to the shame that my mother felt when I told her that I was going to marry my wife and the shame of having a gay daughter, I think it's connected directly to how hard they worked to build everything they had. And now here comes this daughter and you want to, I'm not saying that I am like war, but I am saying I am an external thing that Mm threatened to to take all of that away from them, all of what they had worked so hard for yeah. by the simple fact of who I am. Mm-hmm. And 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 I and I think that that's what I didn't quite succeed in articulating earlier, which is this idea that this is what I'm deeply troubled by and saddened by, which is that how could it be that just because of who I am would be that threat to take everything that mm-hmm. you have from you. But that's that's the society and that's the pressure we have and that's the messaging we have in our society reach right now, which is that to be gay is wrong. Yeah. We're at this really interesting place, I think, in our culture where, and when I say culture, I'm speaking about the American culture and the American context, where I thought, you know, when in 2015, when gay marriage came, became legal, my wife and I, we got married two years after that. But I thought back then in 2015, I was beginning to see really so much sunlight in terms of the future of our country. And it, and, and it felt very hopeful for people like me to just be allowed to exist as we are. And then you flash forward now to 2023 with so many different pressures of erasure. I'm talking book bans, mm-hmm. anti-trans legislation, hate crimes. There's that external pressure of erasure. And then that's almost in a way competing with an internal pressure of erasure because I can tell you, Adam, that shame has come back in a huge way with all Mm. of these external pressures that I'm seeing around me that suddenly books that I love just because they have to, they have LGBTQ plus characters are being banned that um, I, I wake up in the morning and turn on the news and see yet another gay club in Colorado Springs where people are being targeted and murdered because they wanted to dance in Mm -hmm. a safe space. All those things really conspire to just really kind of fortify the shame that I had worked so hard Mm -hmm. to to kind of tackle. And it's it's a daily discipline and it's a daily practice to just fight our own internal pressure of erasure, trying to disappear ourselves. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous place to be when I think about the latest statistic I saw from the Trevor Report was 2022. 
talked about how one in every two queer identified youth between the ages of 13 and 17 has thought about suicide. One in every two. Mm. It's a it's a disturbing and completely unacceptable number. I know I was suicidal when I was a kid and I was trying to come to terms with my own sexual orientation. I doubt that back then every one in two youth between the ages of 13 and 17 had thought about killing themselves. Um, mm. Queer identified youth thought about killing themselves. That's the danger that we're up against right now because it's one thing to be erased by external pressures. It's another thing entirely to physically, as I did as a little girl with that pencil eraser, mm -hmm. and as I did later on in my 20s trying to kill myself because I was so ashamed of being gay. That's really the danger we're up against right now. The taking it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I want to go back to almost where we started when you talked about as you came in, uh, the sense of calm. And it seems like a lot of your work is actually, your journalistic work, your memoir is actually uh, putting words to a lot of this really hard stuff, not just in your own experience, but also in other people's experience. But I want to ask you, because I assume work is not always a source of calm. Right. I want to ask you about that sense of calm and where you find it, how you try to find it these days. Mm. Right now, uh, I have a specific example in mind. Um, my schedule has been so hectic. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have another word for it in the past year after the book came out. And in a, in, a, in a really beautiful and exciting and inspiring ways, just to be invited to so many places around our country mm. to speak on core themes of my book. Um, I absolutely recognize uh, the pure privilege of that and and honor as well I'll, I'll say um but it has it has been a constant go it's been a real blur every year and so when I can when I'm home lately what I do is I I found that I love to just have a solo hike up Mount Si east of Seattle and what I do is I'll, I'll pack myself a, a breakfast before I go, you know, usually yogurt and granola. And most recently, a friend of mine made this beautiful rhubarb compote that I added in there. And I'll get up to the top just for another perspective. And oftentimes, if it's in the middle of the week, since I have a bit of flexibility, I'll be one of maybe three or four, sometimes the only person up there. When you're up that high, mm. it's odd because you think you're on the top of the world when in fact you're just a tiny little dot. You're so insignificant. And you see this land spread out before you. That's my calm. Mm. I, I feel so much joy in that moment. I can just release and let go. Yeah. And just like taking that, breathe in that beautiful, clean Northwest air and that pine, that heady pine resin smell and hear the birds rather than the bombs that I heard in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I'm just reminded of how beautiful this life can be. I mean, we have to, I think, again, really work hard to find that beauty, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Kutsada Riang is a Cambodian-American journalist and author. You can find links to Pizzada's work in our show notes on OregonHumanities.org. The Detour is produced by Kieran Bond. Dave Friedlander is our editor. Adam Davis is our host. Ben Waterhouse, Karina Brisky, and Alexandra Powell Bugden are our assistant producers. Thanks for listening.